Well, welcome back. Today's video is Drying and Warming, Part 2. Part 1 looked at how landscape alterations can cause the Earth's surface to dry and make heat waves worse. Today we're looking at natural cycles and climate seesaws that cause rainfalls to vary and create droughts and floods. The Intertropical Convergence Zone, known as the ITCZ, is a major driver of global atmospheric circulation. Because wherever the air currents are rising or sinking vertically, the surface winds become very calm. Sailors long ago recognized the ITCZ by the calm winds they called the doldrums. Now, satellites recognize the ITCZ by the dense band of clouds. Now the ITC will shift with the sun. It will move north during the northern hemisphere summer and then south in the southern hemisphere. It's also affected by continents that will heat up faster than the ocean and by changing ocean currents that might cause warming and cooling of the ocean surface. The ITCZ is the rising branch of the Greater Hadley Circulation. Solar heating of the tropical surface causes a low pressure system in rising air currents that bring water laden air up into the sky where it condenses, forms clouds, and then falls as precipitation. An example of a city in the Amazon rainforest living in the tropics will experience 90 inches of rain a year. It will have a temperature range of just 15 degrees that will range from a, a daytime high of uh, 89 degrees Fahrenheit and then fall to a nighttime low of just 74 degrees. The circulation now continues, but it's dry and the air when it cools sinks, suppressing convection. And that causes very dry, warm, clear skies. So a city in the Sahara Desert experiencing these conditions will only receive seven inches of rain in a year. And it will have a much greater range of temperatures. Due to clear skies, it's going to have far greater uh, solar heating. So you'll have temperatures of uh, daytime highs of 98 degrees. And then at nighttime, due to the lack of water vapor and the lack of a greenhouse effect, temperatures will fall quickly to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The rising and sinking air of the Hadley circulation causes very distinct and different climate zones, where the ITC in the air is rising, causing precipitation to fall. We see along the tropics is where we find our rainforest. In contrast, where the air is sinking, the air is dry and increased solar radiation, we find the deserts in the hyper-arid areas of the world. One hypothesis of CO2-driven global warming is that it intensifies that Hadley circulation. It is known as the dry gets drier and the wet gets wetter. So if we look at the humid areas, in the rainforest below the ITCZ, we see something that's a little different. Observations show some drying in these wet areas shown by the red splotches. There are places with a little bit of green showing uh, increased wetting. And most of the places that are not red and green show no change at all in precipitation. Looking out where the Hadley circulation has descending dry area, the deserts around the world, we see that there are some drier places getting drier, but say in the Sahara and the Mideast deserts and the, the Mongolian deserts of Asia, we see that the dry areas are getting wetter. Now, this confirms earlier studies where they showed that 10.8% of the global land area only sh are the only places that show dry gets drier and wet gets wetter. In equal amount of regions, 9.5%, of the global land area shows the dry getting wetter and the wet getting drier. And so this intensified Hadley circulation predictions are failing. Due to the ITCZ low pressure system in the tropics, the trade winds are drawn from the subtropics towards the equator. But due to the Earth's rotation, the Coriolis effect 
causes those winds to curl to the west. As a result, those trade winds sweep the surface waters that had heated in the eastern Pacific and sweep them over to the western Pacific and Indian Ocean, creating a region known as the Indo-Pacific Warm Pool, where surface temperatures will vary between 81 and 86 degrees. In contrast, by sweeping away the warm surface layers, this allows the cooler subsurface layers to upwell, causing temperatures in the eastern Pacific to range in the 60s and the 70s. The difference in temperatures between the east and the west causes strong trade winds and intensifies the trade winds, confining the warm Indo-Pacific pool to the west. The models uh, disagree on what CO2 warming will do. Some say that that gradient is going to be lessened, but right now that is not being observed. The Indo-Pacific Warm Pool now provides the heat to be the source of two major natural cycles. The first is the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which consists of two phases. The first phase is the convective phase, much like the ITCZ, where rising air creates clouds and precipitation. Now devoid of, of moisture, the air continues and then sinks, but instead of going north or south like the ITCZ, the sinking air is happening to the east. That sinking air suppresses convection, causes clear skies, and increases the solar heating of the ocean surface. And that heating will eventually transition to a convection phase. Meanwhile, the convection phase, because of the increased cloudiness, inhibits solar radiation. It increases greenhouse effects, but because of the lost solar radiation, the ocean surface cools, and the convective phase here begins to fade. As a result, these two phases move from the west to the east until they reach the cold tongue, where it stops and then starts over again in the Indian Ocean. Now the rising convection phase of the Madden-Julian Oscillation will trigger Rossby wave trains. And by that I mean that the rising water vapor laden air condenses, forms clouds, blocks the sun, and cools the ocean surface. The remaining dry air now continues on and cools and sinks in a different region where it creates clear skies, intensifies the solar heating, and warms the ocean surface. The air that is sunk now diverges along the surface and triggers another convection phase. And so on and so on, we have alternating cycles of rising air and cooling surfaces, alternating with sinking air and warming surfaces that continues across the hemisphere. A recent study has shown that an intense marine heat wave in the Southern Atlantic Ocean was caused by the intensified solar heating caused by dry sinking air that was part of a Rossby wave train that began in the Indian Ocean. The Pacific Warm Pool is also the source of heat energy that drives the globally powerful ENSO cycle. The ENSO cycle consists of two phases, the La Nina phase and the El Nino phase, and is driven by changes in ocean temperatures. Now, the La Nina phase begins with rising air and the convection over the Southeast Asia and Australia. That rising air condenses, forms clouds and heavy precipitation, which will amplify the monsoons. The remaining dry air continues and sinks in areas over Africa and over the Eastern Pacific and North America, which causes high pressure systems and the associated dry conditions. The high pressure system in the Eastern Pacific forces the jet wave to go north, forces storms to go north, uh, depriving the southern United States from any kind of moisture. So, so during La Nina, we have extensive uh, droughts with, throughout the western United States, as which California has been experiencing recently. The La Nina events cause positive feedbacks 
that help generate a 20 to 30 year Pacific decadal oscillation negative phase, where you have more frequent La Niña's. There also seems to be a suggestion that there might be century oscillations of more frequent La Niña's. During the medieval warm period, between 950 and 1250 AD, based on coral evidence, we see that the Pacific Ocean exhibited more La Niña-like temperatures. And due to that, the southwest of the United States experienced extensive droughts. The resulting droughts, exasperated by deforestation, forced the divide, demise of the southwest Pueblo cultures, such as the Mesa Verde ruins can testify to. Now in contrast, the La Nina condition simultaneously causes greater monsoon rainfall near Asia and Australia. And as an example, in 2010 La Nina, heavy rainfall over the basins of Australia with no ocean outlets, endorheic basins, caused enough water to accumulate that the global sea level dropped by five to seven millimeters. The El Nino phase begins when the trade winds weaken and the warm water stored in the Western Pacific warm pool sloshes across towards the Americas. The intense rising convection now shifts location and brings heavy precipitation to the coast of the Americas. The remaining dry air now continues and either subsides and sinks over the Atlantic or over Southeast Asia and Australia, causing droughts and failed monsoons. Here we can see a wave train of, from an El Nino causing alternating patterns of wet and dry areas. In the 1998 El Nino, heavy floods in California coincided with drought and heavy wildfires in Indonesia. The 20 to 30 year positive phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation results in much more frequent El Ninos. And there's also a su suggestion of century long cycles. During the Little Ice Age between 1250 and 1900 AD, associated with decreased solar energy from sunspot minimums, resulting in reduced trade winds, the temperature patterns across the Pacific resembled El Nino-like conditions. That resulted in a failure of the Asian monsoons between 1756 and 1768, and the collapse of kingdoms in Vietnam, Myanmar, and Thailand. Similarly, El Nino-like conditions caused the East Indian droughts between 1790 and 1796, which caused widespread devastating starvation. Like the Madden-Julian oscillation, the El Nino cycles are not correlated with CO2 concentrations or warming temperatures. During the warmest period of the Holocene, the Holocene optimum between 6,000 and 8,000 BC, there was minimal El Nino activity during those warm periods. What all this suggests is that these climate dynamics of these natural cycles, the, the natural control knob of changing climates. Up next will be climates, floods, and atmospheric rivers. And until then, again, I advise you to embrace the renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice, skepticism is the highest of duties, and blind faith the one unpardonable sin. And if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science rarely presented and often obscured by mainstream media, then please give it a like, share it with as many people as possible, subscribe to my channel, or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, An Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.